about 80% of Singaporeans live in HDB. And yet there's so much talk about upgrading, usually moving to a condominium. It makes it sound like HDB is a very low class and substandard housing and you can't wait to move out of it. Is it really the case? My impression of a HDB, I mean having uh, grown up in one, staying in one, my impression of a HDB it is, is that it is a very um, affordable housing. Generally, the financial commitment is a lot more lesser and you can afford to pay off the loan relatively quickly. There is much lesser financial stress. And HDB also tend to be quite good quality and uh, well-built. Come with proper bedrooms, two or three a good size bedroom, a proper living room, and also good size separate kitchen that you can do your heavy Asian kind, uh, Asian style cooking. It suits our lifestyle very well. The you know, do you know that when the government give out some kind of like um subsidy or incentives, for example, like now we have got the COVID nineteen issues and the government give up give out help to the residents. If you live in HDB, you qualify. But if you live in uh, private properties, you may not qualify. So what's wrong with staying in a HDB? I really don't, don't see the problem, you know. So what does moving to a condominium mean to you? Uh, instantly, yeah, maybe you get an upgrade in status, huh? because it's, it's all about marketing. So you move to, uh, when you tell people you are staying in a condominium, maybe they look at you a bit differently and you feel good. So there's an upgrade in feeling, upgrade in status. But you must also remember there's an upgrade in price also. And who's going to pay for it? You yourself. I know some people will say that, yeah, we make use of other people's uh, money to grow our wealth. I'm not really sure whether that is a right context to... To use it you know seriously because you must remember that you are now taking on more loan for consumption that is the uh, the property that you are staying in and you have to pay for it yourself it's not as if like you have a tenant to pay for your loan so it means that job security is important because you now have a bigger loan you cannot afford to lose your job so you see you may be staying in a very nice condominium uh and people look at you nicely, but actually you may not be sleeping well because of the stress and extra financial burden. Is that really an upgrade? That's, that's not all. It's like, think about it, a lot of condominiums are so small, you know. And now with a husband and wife working from home, children doing more home-based learning at home, all of you are cooked up at home. Is it is it comfortable? I can think a lot of I can think of a lot of mental stress and maybe conflicts, you know, things like that, just because of the small space. I don't think that is an upgrade. And not just that, there's no guarantee on price growth. Let's face it. It's not from me. You can refer to, uh, there's a property newspaper. I think it's a weekly newspaper called The Edge. Inside this newspaper, every in every issue, they have a table top 10 most profitable deals and top 10 least profitable deals. Uh, I believe that before you look at the top 10 most profitable ones, look at the top 10 most unprofitable ones because you take care of the downside, right? And then the upside will take care of itself. You'll find that there are many deals, uh, private property deals that are actually losing money if you bought at the wrong time. So the risk is really there. I know there are many agents uh, selling this asset progression idea. They will encourage a couple to sell their HDB and then move to private property. The best thing for them is uh, when you sell your HDB, husband buy a private property and wife buy another one. One for own use, one for investment, you know. So now you buy two properties and you avoid the scenario of having to pay for additional buyer stamp duty. Uh, just take note of this, that there is no guarantee that price will increase and no guarantee that they will rent well and there will be extra expenses for you. At one time, 
the rental vacancy rate in Singapore is about 7 to 8 percent. So in case your property cannot rent out, you must be able to handle the mortgage, the extra expenses uh, in terms of the maintenance, property tax and so on. These are really serious considerations. And then I want to highlight two clear benefits that your agent may not tell you. Uh, two clear benefits of HDB over condominium. Number one, do you know that uh, in case in case your financial problems, you can't pay your loans and whatever, your creditor cannot seize your HDB. They can seize your the content of your HDB, but they cannot seize your HDB. It's by law. Whereas your condominium, your private property is different. Your private property can be seized by your creditor. Your, for your HDB, if you continue to service the, the monthly mortgage, it just cannot be seized. So you are protected and you will always have a roof over your head. Number two, the way that the lease is calculated huh, is also uh, different. Usually, for HDB, it's definitely a uh, leasehold property, 99 years. And most of the condominiums that the people are buying are also on leasehold title because of affordability. So, for the private uh, condominiums, the lease, they start to count the lease, the 99 years countdown. Uh, it starts when a developer buy the land. For HDB, it's not. It's when you collect the key. So, you just think, it sounds like it's already more worthwhile, right? Because by the time when you collect the re the key of your condominium, it's usually what? Maybe four, five, six, seven years after 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 the developer bought the land, you know. So it's like your 99 years, you already got to minus off so many years. It's a, to me that's like um a discount. It's not it's not something that's very worthwhile and motivating to me. I would rather stay in a central HDB then a condominium very far away from town put it that way and many of the central HDB you find that the value is actually um, a lot more higher and they also tend to be more sustainable sustainable uh, versus the versus the uh, condominium at a far away places just to be practic practical but you know, having said about all these things, we all these things we know that the property investment is still a good way to create wealth. So what are the HDB people supposed to do, right? Because uh usually we we'll buy HDB if it's a husband and wife, both of them their names will be on the HDB uh title. And then if they buy a second residential property, they'll be subjected to uh, additional buyer stamp duty, which is quite a serious amount and everyone tries to avoid that. So does it mean that they forever cannot uh, invest in property anymore? Um, of course, there are ways to overcome that. You know, we just got to be more flexible and open-minded to find out more. That's not what many people are doing because uh, they may not get the correct information just based on hearsay and then they write off the whole idea. I can give you a few uh, simple, simple ways to do this. One way to still invest in a property uh, without paying A, B, uh, S, D, and you, because you stay in the HDB, right, is to invest in an industrial property. You can do that. Buy an industrial property in Singapore. You don't need to pay A, B, S, D. Some uh, disadvantages, the, the main one, again, will be on the lease issue. Most of the uh, industrial properties in Singapore, they are on lease hold title, and the lease tend to be quite short. 30 to about 60 years. So imagine if you are now 35 years old, you buy an industrial property with a lease of say uh, 35 years and the lease will, so the lease will run out when you're 70 years old. So you have nothing, you know. Now you may, you may enjoy some kind of uh, positive cash flow, but your property really depreciates and you will have nothing when you're 70 years old. It doesn't sound like it's a very good idea to me. Another way that you can invest, if you want to invest in a residential property, is that you can consider uh, overseas property. Choose a good location and blah, blah, blah. Uh, in my opinion, Australia is a good location huh? and we, we are doing it. But 
we we talk to many people and then the misconception is real most most of the time when we tell people about australian properties the first thing they say uh, will be something like oh it has got high tax rate so that's it you know yeah on the surface they have got high tax rate but what if i tell you that i have never paid any tax there not on my rental income i don't pay property tax also huh how do i do it is it legal of course it is you know you just got to educate yourself allow yourself the opportunity uh to have more information so you can make an informed decision on what's best for you according to your uh, personal situation of course so for australia property uh it works like that we, they have got a different accounting system generally if you take the maximum financing and then you claim a uh, depreciation there's no tax payable on your rental income for many years and then also uh, if you structure your property well you buy them at the right places right property right places and so on usually there's also no property tax but think about it on your singapore property is different on your singapore property whatever net rental income you have huh, uh, has to be added to your big salary and to be taxed at a higher tax bracket every year and you also need to pay property tax so i just told you that in australia there is no i don't pay tax versus in singapore so which is better there are many ways to do it you know so you just got to uh, how do i say uh, find out the information and learn from others how they do it it's up to you if you if you do nothing i mean you can continue to stay in your hdb it is good low cost and everything but there are still other ways for you to grow your wealth and it's up to you whether you take action or not if not you you'll be there thinking after 20 years what could i have done